Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. This podcast, my website, and my weekly newsletter all focus on the goal of translating the science of longevity into something accessible for everyone. Our goal is to provide the best content in health and wellness, full stop, and we've assembled a great team of analysts to make this happen. If you enjoy this podcast, we've created a membership program that brings you far more in-depth content if you want to take your knowledge of this space to the next level. At the end of this episode, I'll explain what those benefits are, or if you want to learn more now, head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. Now, without further delay, here's today's episode. I guess this week is Dr. Eric Topol. Eric is a very famous cardiologist, geneticist, and digital medicine researcher slash pioneer. He's the founder and director of the Scripps Research Translational Institute, TSRI. And prior to coming to Scripps, he served as the chairman of cardiovascular medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, a post he held for about 15 years. We actually start the interview by talking about the story that led to him leaving the Cleveland Clinic. And actually, we spent quite a bit of time on this story, which is something that I certainly remember following during its unfolding in the early part of the 2000s. He's also the editor-in-chief of Medscape, and in 2012, he published a book called The Creative Destruction of Medicine. What we talk about today, though, is his, I believe his third book, but it could be his fourth, called Deep Medicine. And this is something I've been wanting to talk with Eric about for some time, because it really goes into, in a non-sci-fi way, the application of artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning in medicine, which is, as you probably realize, a field that is at times upsettingly slow to adopt to technical change. We talk about a lot of things in this episode, and in a surprisingly a brief period of time for one of my podcasts, actually, we talk a lot about the gut biome and I actually have a great and spirited discussion about it because as some of you may know, I'm kind of a skeptic of this whole gut biome is going to be the answer to all of our, all of our woes. But I think in the end, Eric and I really kind of end up being much more closely aligned in our views of the utility of this tool as a way to provide predictive insights. In fact, there are a number of things that I came out of this episode with some follow-up notes for myself as far as people I want to connect with, researchers that I want to connect with to better understand how I can utilize that information for some of my own clinical interests. I think what comes across in in the end of this discussion is that doctors aren't going anywhere. And in fact, Eric has a slightly contrarian view of what the impact of AI in medicine will be. Um, He he argues that it's not at all that doctors are going to go away. It's just that doctors are going to change their focus and frankly, focus on the one thing that doctors and, and humans in general can do far better than machines. So with that said, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Eric Topol. Well, Eric, thanks so much for for coming over on a Friday afternoon. Great to be with you, Peter. This is kind of funny because we've both lived in San Diego for over 10 years and your name comes up all the time. Everybody says to me, you must know Eric Tobel. And I say, well, of course I know of him, but no, I don't know him. And where it really comes up is every time I'm at Dexcom. Uh And obviously you're on the board there and I know Kevin Sayer very well and I met several folks on the team. So it's hard to believe this is the first time we're meeting. It is. I've heard a lot about you over the years, Peter. Now, you mentioned Dexcom. I've been on their board for nine years, and I've watched this early medical wireless world of sensors be transformed. So that's been really a privilege. Whereas most people think about steps as a wearable sensor and not glucose. So, you know, it's been a great company that started when, nine years ago, at least when I started with them. They were really having a rough time to get people with type 1 diabetes to use continuous glucose, and that's really changed a lot. Yeah, Kevin and I met about four years ago on an airplane. I still refer to it as certainly one of the top two luckiest seating assignments I ever had to be sitting next to Kevin and immediately clicked, and I've never taken the sensor off since. You can see I'm wearing my G6 right right, now. Right, right, wow. And I agree, I mean it's sort of comical when people think about the number of steps one's taking as, as a quote unquote wearable or, or, or a valuable insight when you think about what could be measured in the interstitial fluid. And glucose, of course, is just the, the thin end of the wedge on that. And Exactly. I think a lot of people haven't realized how, where this is headed. The more concern, of course, is using it in the right people. That's like, for example, the Apple Watch for heart rhythm, where so many people are, are using it and it's a recipe for false positives. But if you use these sort of things, these more advanced sensors properly, they could be really a big difference. 
you're one of the earliest adopters of mobile telemetry and you know mobile devices or outside of hospital devices, ambulatory devices to be able to measure heart rhythm. You know, I wasn't even planning to ask you about that, but I, I can't resist at this moment. Give people a little bit of background about you. Obviously, you're a cardiologist. We're going to talk about what you've done at the Cleveland Clinic and what you've done here at Scripps. But what interested you in cardiology in the first place? Well, it wasn't really cardiology that got me into medicine. It was the interest in endocrinology. My father had been a type 1 diabetic and had every complication you can imagine. He was blind by age 49. So I decided that since that seemed to be such a primitive area as far as no prevention and lack of treatments outside of insulin, that maybe that would be the way to go. And so when I went to UC San Francisco for my residency, it was really to get geared up to be a diabetologist. And what happened there was I was completely transfixed by what was going on in cardiology, particularly Kanu Chatterjee, who's been a medical hero of mine, had a big influence in, in really changing the path. It was also a very remarkable time in that it was the first balloon angioplasty, the coronary arteries, the first clot dissolving therapy for heart attack, and so many other things that you, it was captivating. So I've never regretted that change, but it wasn't what I had initially in mind. The field of cardiology today is so specialized. It's, I mean, to say that one would do a residency in medicine followed by a fellowship in cardiology would be as broad as doing a residency in general surgery today, where, you know, the, the field has maybe stated in another way, an interventional cardiologist versus a lipidologist would have virtually nothing in common outside of their foundational training in cardiology. I mean, I don't know that many people actually appreciate that outside of medicine. Do you? No, you're really right, Peter. Uh, there's these subspecialties. It could be a heart failure or prevention or the plumbers, interventional or the electricians, electrophysiology, and on and on. So it's a very broad discipline. The field has matured so much in the last decade or two. There are obvious benefits to that. What do you think are the limitations of that stratification? Well, the major limitation is that you get this ice pick view of the patient. You know, when you see a patient as an interventional cardiologist, you're thinking about what arteries can I fix? And the electricians are thinking about the person as a, having an arrhythmia. So the general cardiologist, which is the group of people that would be the advocates to prevent unnecessary procedures... They don't get enough respect. It's just like, you know, primary care internal medicine doctors. And so we really want to boost them up because they are the ones that are really caring for patients and looking out for their overall cardiovascular health. How long ago did you sort of get the sense that we didn't have to be in the hospital with a 12 lead EKG on a patient to appreciate what was happening in the conduction system of their heart. And in fact, I, I, I feel like I even remember seeing you on TV 10 years ago on CNN or Good Morning America for all I know. I, I honestly can't even remember. But you were in a clinic and you were sort of saying, look, there's going to be a day when a patient at home is going to wear a device and it's going to send me a warning sign that something is going on. Right. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because... It was kind of a serendipitous connection to San Diego. So it was, I think, 1999. I had gotten to know the folks at Kleiner Perkins pretty well. And this guy, Brooke Byers, contacted me. And he said, you know, we're looking at this company called CardioNet. We don't really understand this thing about being able to do electrocardiogram monitoring over the internet. Could you look at this thing? I'm going to send you the slide deck. So... It was, you know, 1999, 20 years ago. I looked at this thing. I said, whoa, this is an eye-opener. And it was a San Diego-based company. And you were still in Cleveland at the time. Yes, yes. And the whole idea was things were starting to really converge of the idea, at least, of medicine and the internet. But the sense that you could monitor people remotely, continuously, for multiple leads of their cardiogram was really exciting because up until that time, the only way we could do that was to put on one of these bulky Holter monitors. This is Norman Holter from the 1950 version. We still, we still talk about his name. <laughs> they're they're still, still using it. And, you know, that is, you can't exercise, really. You can't take a shower. You know, it's, you can't wear, wear this too long. And it isn't real time. You then send it in and, you know, you get, or you go back to the clinic and take it off. And so it's so antiquated when you think about it. So the idea that 
we could transcend that era with this mobile continuous monitoring. And by the way, there are people who have been on a halter who died suddenly. And the halter, of course, serves no purpose other than to tell you what arrhythmia killed them. Exactly. So now it's a whole different world. And then you start to wait, wait a minute, why don't we just do everything? Not just a cardiogram. We could do all the vital signs. We, we can get rid of hospitals or at least those hospital patients who are not in an intensive care unit. And I think that's where we're headed. That is, 20 years ago was kind of the entry point with this first dedicated wireless company, CardioNet. And it's just where we're going to build on to ultimately eradicate the need for most hospital rooms, which is a pretty big deal. And it's probably the most transformative aspect of where we're headed because that's the number one item for healthcare costs. It's not just the facilities, but the personnel. And so they account for a third of our $3.6 trillion annual healthcare budget. Medicine seems to always take longer to adopt things. I mean, I think in general, as people, we tend to have optimism that exceeds the pace at which, you know, technology moves forward. I mean, in some ways, engineering examples get overused. We talk about uh, the Manhattan Project, which is kind of remarkable when you really stop to think about it, that in such a short period of time, they could go from a proof of concept in the early 40s to a finished product, you know, in 44 even the space race is kind of remarkable in terms of the accuracy with which they were able to sort of project and map out the steps. It doesn't seem that healthcare follows that curve. It doesn't just follow a straight Moore's law. Well, it, it actually defies Moore's law. Because yeah, if, yeah, it sure if, does. If you plot that out, you look at, wow, the cost of chips has gotten so incredibly low over the course now of 50 plus years and healthcare costs are going the opposite direction. So, their lack of embracement of the digital era and also the lack of it having the impact of lowering costs is notable. It's palpable. It's a general resistance. You know, I, I liken it to a sclerotic or ossified nature of the medical community, very resistant to change. The only time you see lack of resistance when it is tied to markedly improved reimbursement. For example, you know, the adoption of robots like da Vinci or you know, something like that. But otherwise, there's just no real incentive to change. And of course, we want to be careful because we don't want to adopt a significant change when it isn't validated or proven. But when we when we see things that are unquestionably advances and still unwillingness to move in that direction, that's disconcerting. Yeah, it is. And there are a few problems I've contemplated where no matter how much time and energy I put into it, I really can't even see the direction of the solution. I think there are some problems, even the political system, when you think about how broken our political system is, I don't think you, you don't have to be a student of political science to appreciate that. But I think most people who spend a lot of time thinking about it, if given a magic wand, would know how to move in the right direction, right? If you stop gerrymandering, if you maybe discarded the electoral college, like th there are like five things that you could do structurally that would bring politics back into a sort of more civilized era. But if you said to me, wave a magic wand, what, how do you fix medicine? The only idea I've ever had is one that involves changing behaviors directly, which of course becomes a bit of a tautology. But it seems to be that the disconnect between the driver of demand and the one who pays the bill is the biggest problem. Does that kind of resonate with you? In other words, in this system, which is not a budget-driven healthcare system like it is in the UK, it's a demand-driven system. So the, the system will rise to the cost of the demand. The demand is mostly driven by the patient and the physician, the patient requiring the care, the physician ordering the treatment. But they bear less than, I mean, they bear maybe, I think the last thing I saw said about 11% of the total cost is, is borne by those driving demand, which is sort of like you walking into a car dealership and knowing you only have to pay 11% of the car price it's going to completely uncouple any reality. To me, that seems like the elephant in the room. And that's why I think the problem is, as you stated, which is why are hospitals so expensive? Well, if people actually saw the bill of, you know, a hospital stay and realized what the, you know, the gauze and the pillowcase were being charged for, I mean, they'd, they'd scream, but of course they don't have to pay it directly. They're only paying it indirectly. Right. It's a really messed up system in so many respects. You touched on one big one, but 
the basis of this absurd healthcare charges. It's just unfathomable. And all the things that have been done to date, like Obamacare and the debate now about Medicare for all or whatever, doesn't get to the root of the problem, which is the cost. That's right. It's politically in vogue to deal with access, yeah. which is an important problem. Absolutely. But if you expand access without reducing cost, you trade one bad problem for another bad problem. That was so educational for me because uh, over the past uh, year and a half, I worked with the NHS to review their health system, in particular, the impact of technology, AI, digital medicine, genomics. And as you already mentioned, Peter, they have a system which can be changed like a light switch. They don't have the single payer and they have far better outcomes than we do at about a third of the cost per person. And what's interesting is they have the will to make these changes. They're adopting things at a rate that is there's no comparison to the U.S. Like, for example, they already have places in the U.K. where they've gotten rid of keyboards instead of doctors typing and being data clerks. But they're also interested in making things more efficient than they already are more efficient than we are. But the difference is the incentives, just as you outlined. This is not employer-based health care. This is not copay related. This is health care for everyone. And we're going to make it as good as we can and as least expensive as we can. So that country is, in many respects, a different model. Canada is like it. And many countries in Europe are, are similar and we're so remotely disparate. It's just unfortunate. You know, I grew up in Canada, so I have sort of mixed feelings about the discussion of a single payer system because I've seen the advantages of it and you've outlined them. I don't know an, as much about the NHS, which may be better than in Canada. It's not national. It's done by each province. So, but it's still universal coverage within each province. But that said, my whole family's still in Canada. And I will say the following when they get care, it seems to be pretty good. But boy, is it hard for them to get care sometimes. It depends what you need, right? You right. Know, if you if you need if you need a coronary artery bypass and you you know have critical stenosis, you'll get excellent care in Toronto. You know, it's right. it'll be no worse than it would be in the best hospital in New York or San Francisco. But if you have a torn ACL, <laughs> it might take you six months to get that MRI. Now we could debate whether or not in the long run that matters as much, right. but you know, I've always found it interesting that at least a country like Canada, and again, I don't, you can speak to the UK for me, there's great resistance to have a second layer of private insurance on top of the public that would allow that, which to me seems like the best hybrid solution, which is you have to have a safety net that provides universal coverage for everyone. But if an individual decides, look, I'm willing to pay an extra $10,000 a year, which by the way is still a fraction of what I pay to insure my family you now have a separate queue that you can go into. You know, so it's, I mean, it's like Disneyland, right? It's like in Disneyland, you can do the special pass where you don't have to wait in line. You pay an extra whatever it is. Why do you think that places like Canada for sure, but maybe even the UK have resistance to secondary insurance? Well, they, they have secondary insurance. People have that. In many respects, it works like you just described. I see. So the, so the NHS has a second tier that one can buy privately. Yes. The main difference is there's a philosophy that if you're a citizen, as you said, healthcare is a right. It's, it's a right, a, not a privilege. Just, yeah. yeah. And then there are people that have this added insurance. It does separate a small fraction of people into this other class of getting access to more rapidly to perhaps a different queue, as you uh, outlined it. But for the most part, it's a small proportion of the people in the UK, and I think it's somewhat similar in Canada. But I think the difference really is that there's two big poles of problems, if you look at it in the US. There's the indigent, who either don't have access, or if they do, they're just not getting the kind of care that you would like to see. And then there's the affluent who get too much. They mm -hmm. get overcooked. They get executive physicals and they get all this stuff that shouldn't be done. And the outgrowth of that is bad outcomes. They get incidental illness. You don't see that in the UK and in a lot of other countries. So we, we have this problem at both ends. And most of the recognition has been on the end of the 
underrepresented and indigent, not on the the people who are getting uh, overcooked, and that's a problem. I interviewed uh, Marty Macri a little while ago, and he's written very eloquently about this this problem, specifically with respect to f- to pharmacotherapy. You know, you mentioned executive physical. Well, your alma mater, of course, is one of the places that you know is it certainly has to be regarded as one of the the finest hospital centers in the United States, and then by extension, the world. And I feel like I've had half a dozen patients come back from their executive physicals there, or more so ask me if they should go and get it. So when did you, when did you get to Cleveland? Early 90s? Yeah, I got there in 91. And what was the Cleveland Clinic in 91? It wasn't as well known as it is now. It was particularly well known for bypass surgery. It was the place where Rene Favalaro essentially invented bypass surgery. And also Floyd Loop had uh, really brought in the internal mammary artery, which was a big advance. It also had some other traditions. Uh, I mean, Mason Soans had been there, discovered coronary angiographies. Was it considered at that time ahead of Minnesota, which was also arguably one of the earliest pioneers? You know, Stanford and Minnesota were really these huge pioneers in earlier cardiovascular medicine. Well, I think in cardiovascular, that was its signature contribution. I mean, obviously there were others, but it was... Lillehei, of course, was, you know, yeah. Shumway and Lillehei were kind of these gods. Exactly. I, I think the main, you know, for coronary disease, because there had been so many, a cluster of remarkable innovations, that's where it had its biggest footprint. And when I went there, there was by far more bypass surgery done at Cleveland Clinic than anywhere in the world. And you had gone after UCSF training, you went to University of Michigan? Well, there was one stop in between. That was at Johns Hopkins where I did cardiology. Oh, I don't think I knew that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have this one overlap in our backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. And then I went to, I was seven years at University of Michigan. My first job, my second job at Cleveland Clinic, it was almost 14 years. But When I went there in 91, it wasn't a really strong academic center. It was, in fact, I'll never forget my chief of medicine at Michigan. When I told him I'm going to Cleveland Clinic, he said, well, that's the end of your academic career. It was viewed as almost going into private practice? It was viewed as, well, high volume, factory medicine, you know, high quality, but, you know. Did you have a strong residency fellowship system underneath you? Were you going to be heavily involved in training? There was a medicine fellowship system, but I don't know that I would qualify it as strong academically, you know, large, lots of them, but they weren't doing cutting edge research and there wasn't that kind of scholarly environment. So my mission when I went there to refute the uh, Yamada's uh, view that it was the end of a career was actually to do just the opposite and enliven it and wake up the curiosity and the innovations. So that's what we did. And, you know, it was a big transformation because it involved a whole new team, you know, bringing, it was like an exchange transfusion because they weren't, they hadn't written a paper in the cardiology division in a couple of years. Really? Yeah, it was, it was pretty, it was very much dominated by cardiac surgery and there was just limited high productivity in the academic side. So it really comes down to incentives again. I mean, today we see the opposite problem, of course, where we have the proliferation of total nonsense journals and absolute horrible things that don't pass for science being written constantly because, of course, the pendulum on the incentive is you have to publish. Right. And so presumably at Cleveland, that was simply not that the pendulum was the exact opposite, where you're, you were probably compensated based on clinical productivity and nothing more. Yeah. I mean, I think the cardiologists, when I talked to them, when I was interviewing, and then when I got there, beached in, they said, you know, we're the handmaidens of the surgeons. And they were so busy taking care of the patients because the surgeons didn't really see the patients outside of the operating room. And they needed, obviously, this high volume of patients needed a lot of care. And there weren't that many cardiologists. So the cardiologists would run the the critical care and the step-down units and everything. Everything. Wow. So they really were giving great care, but they were consumed by that. Mm -hmm. So they didn't really have the time, nor did a lot of them, since it was highly inbred then, really have the knack of asking questions and chasing them down and whatnot. So we brought in a whole group. I mean, I started, there were 30 cardiologists. When I left, there were over 90. Were you brought in as the chairman of cardiology? Right, right. No, I was age 35. Actually, it was really funny, Peter, when you think about it. Bill Belichick and I started the same day. Bill Belichick was the youngest football coach in the NFL history, head coach, and I was the youngest chairman in the history of Cleveland Clinic. So we got to know each other a little bit. It was a very different era for Bill Belichick. 
who's my favorite coach, by the way. Is that right? I'd oh, say I mean, I'm obsessed with Bill Belichick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I met uh, Tony Gonzalez recently. Oh, wow. And he told the absolute funniest story about his experience with Bill Belichick at the Pro Bowl one year, which I won't restate now, but in the show notes, we'll link to a video of Tony telling that story along with an article that was written up about it at some point. But I'm fundamentally just obsessed with, with Belichick. Well, he's a really he's, interesting he's a, it's, guy. It's a, it's a bucket list for me to meet him at some point. Wow. You know, he's, he's a kind of fascinating figure for many reasons. Actually, one of the most memorable things that happened regarding Bill Belichick was he benched Bernie Kosar. That didn't go over well. And Art Modell, who was the chairman of the board of Cleveland Clinic, we were good friends, and we, he was over for dinner at our house, this had all happened and it was an uproar, you know, with the dog pound and everything. And so Art and Pat were over and they said, you know, well, we had to put a sign in front of our house. Bill Belichick doesn't live here. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they were, there was as much fear of what was happening then as when, you know, Art Modell moved the Browns to, to Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. 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 So during those almost 14 years, it was great to see, you know, this kind of renaissance of... And you were supported. Yeah, I mean... Because, I mean, presumably you would not have left Michigan without an explicit understanding that you were not coming to implement the status quo, you were coming to rattle it. Exactly. And, you know, it was really because of Floyd, as we knew him, Fred Loop. He was a very progressive CEO of Cleveland Clinic. He, even though he'd been a cardiac surgeon throughout his career, and in fact, in the early years, was still operating, he wanted to see cardiology thrive. He he's, saw, not, he's not alive anymore. Is no, he? no. Unfortunately, he died of a rare cancer uh, a few years back, but at a young age, because uh, it was a surprise. He had such longevity in his family. He said, to Eric, you know, I want you to come in and, you know, just completely get this place uh, supercharged, make cardiology the the greatest anywhere, and I'll back you 100%. And not only that, but in 2000, in year 2000, when I was thinking about leaving, actually to go to Stanford, he said, why do you want to go to Stanford in medical school? Let's just start one here. And so that gave me the green light to work with Case Western to get a new medical school. And there hadn't been one in Cleveland or in the country for 26 years. So that was the show of Loop to be a great leader. I mean, he wasn't threatened by cardiology. He wasn't threatened by making it a far more academic environment. He actually saw those odds pluses. He was, uh, you know, an extraordinary leader. We would have had that second overlap if he'd come to Stanford because I was I graduated from Stanford Med School in '01. Oh wow! When I was looking there to be the dean, it was just after the divorce. It was like a low time morale was it, broken. It was. So so what was his name? I'm blanking. There was a dermatologist who was yeah, the dean. Yeah, yeah. Whose name, uh, Eugene Bauer. Exactly. Was that his name? He was the one. He yeah. was the one that I, I think basically in the failure of that merger, it made sense that there was going to be a regime change. I don't know if Phyllis Gardner was ever in the running for it, but I always liked her. She was top drawer. I was super impressed by her. But a pediatrician. Yes, from Boston. And he was there for... A number of years, and I know who you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Last name begins with a P. I don't recall. Yeah, but... pa- uh, Pizzo. Pizzo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had been at Boston uh, Infectious Disease Pediatrics, and he was kind of opposite of the Stanford way. He was anti-entrepreneurial, anti, uh, in many respects, innovation. So it was an interesting to see how that worked out. But before I had decided I didn't want to go there, mainly. So the job you were potentially going to take at Stanford was to be the dean, not to be the division chief of right. medicine or cardiology. Got it. Yeah, no. And I, I was, at the time, I thought it was a dream uh, job. I thought Stanford, even though it was coming at, at a tough time in the wake of this UCSF Stanford breakup, I thought, you know, hey, it's unilateral. It can only get better. Absolutely. But of course, knowing what I know, the little bit that I know about what it means to be the dean of a hospital, it seems like that would have not allowed you to thrive in the way that you ended up yes. ultimately finding a second home. That's an astute point. You know, you have to know what you're good at, and that might not have been a good fit in retrospect. But I was restless. I, I was looking for a change. And in fact, working on getting the new medical school at Cleveland, which we basically got in 2002, and the first class came in 2004. That kept me busy. I need. I always need a kind of big project to, to know something that's a reach to keep me going. And so that was important that it actually was a four-year run to on top of the other things I was doing is to get that new med school off the ground. 
Now, there's something else that happened in in the twilight of your career at Cleveland Clinic that that I want to talk about because it's on a personal level it was very near and dear to me, which was your involvement in the uncovering or elucidation of the challenges with a with a medication called Vioxx. This is such an interesting example of it's a case study in so many things, right? Because I'll state for you at the outset my bias in this entire story, and then I want to go into the story in detail. If I could go back in time and be czar for a month or a day or a year, I would have put a black box warning on Vioxx. I would have left it on the market for most people who could have tolerated it and made sure that it was very transparent that this is going to increase the risk of a subset of the population and everybody's happy. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. Merck, I think in the in the hubris of wanting to deny that there was any potential patient subset that could be harmed by this drug, ended up spending, by my calculation, at least four years probably concealing data. You'll tell us the story and it may be longer. And in the end, a lot of people lost what I still consider to be probably the best COX-2 inhibitor that was ever out there. So that's my bias. I could be wrong. I, actually, all of the above. I, I agree with everything you Do said. You? Okay. All totally. Right. And we never discussed it. We never met before. No, no. So now let's talk about the story. So tell people what a COX-2 inhibitor was and why was it such a big deal when these drugs came out in the late 90s? Well, this was at that time viewed as the most important blockbuster in medicine, Vioxx and Celebrex. They were competing with each other. They, I think, introduced right around 99. And it was a race because there's multi-billions of dollars for each drug. The promise was instead of the Advil and Aleve and other non-steroidals that they would replace, they would spare the stomach. They would be more potent to relieve pain and better anti-inflammatories. That was how they were billed. And the reason, because they were selective. So these cyclooxygenase enzymes that the Aleves of the world indiscriminately block them. And one of the problems is, yes, you get the anti-inflammation that relieves your pain, but you also rip apart sort of the gastric lining and a whole bunch of other things in the, in the wake. And of course, as you said, Celebrex and Vioxx came along and said, we're going to selectively target just cyclooxygenase 2, which almost seemed too good to be true, by the way. In medicine, it doesn't often work that that happens, <laughs> that you can selectively hit one of these two enzymes. But nevertheless, that was yeah, the... Yeah, I mean, they did have some selectivity, yes, but yes. not as much as advertised. But nonetheless, I wasn't really paying attention to this because... Right, you're not a rheumatologist or an orthopedist. This is no, out of your wheelhouse. No, and, and I'm not even into drug safety. That was not the kind of thing I was into. And in fact, it was only because... This remarkable fellow of ours, Deb Mukherjee, who now is the chief of cardiology in Texas. But at that time, he came to me and said, Dr. Topol, I'm looking at this data from the FDA. And this, what they're saying is that the Vioxx is really not at all causing any heart problems. It's actually that the comparator, the naproxen, was the one that is decreasing. Providing a benefit. That, yeah. was, that was the argument. And, and I said, well, you know, Deb, this is the FDA. They approved this drug, you know, this is a year plus after they approved it. And I said, how did you get this data? Because back then, to get into the bowels of the FDA website wasn't so easy. But he, Not, yeah. he did it on his own. Wow. So I give him credit. And I looked at it. First, I didn't believe it. But then we spent quite a bit of time. Now, do you remember the numbers? Because I, I remember that it was naproxen. But do you remember what the absolute risk difference was between naproxen and, and Vioxx in that first cohort? Yeah, I don't. There was this trial called Vigor. I don't remember the exact numbers. But it was something like an excess of heart attacks in the Vioxx arm, rofecoxib, that was not trivial if you look at it per 100 people. My recollection, I could be wrong, and we will link to all of this in great detail, so it'll be, for those of you listening, this will be completely accurate in the show notes. I want to say it was like 15 deaths per 10,000, but I don't remember what the baseline, I don't remember what the naproxen number was. Yeah, I think was. it was 15 per 1,000. 15 per 1,000? Or, or, or okay, up yeah. to 20 per 1,000, depending on how you interpret the data. But there was a definite gap. And so first I was questioning Deb, and then we raked over the data. And I said, you know what? You're onto something here. But, but at that time, Eric, did you think that naproxen provided cardioprotection? No, I, actually, I said, where did that come from? Okay, so in other words, you, were, you sort of questioned the very, premise. Very peculiar. Because there was no data to really support that. And it seemed like a very odd explanation for this excess of heart attacks. We went over the data and I said, you know what, we've got to publish this because this is really important. And, and so we put together a paper, it went to JAMA, 
It was published. Uh, this was oh one. Oh one. No, it was published in oh one. In fact, it was I think August thirtieth, oh one. You know what? I I remember it so well. I remember where I was reading it. Yeah, it was the summer of oh one. It was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. It was on a lot of other front pages. But there, it quoted me as saying, "We could be facing a public health disaster." Now, did I ever know that that would be the case? Did I ever know that it would be three years later to the date, September 1, that Merck had this abrupt withdrawal? And in the process, by the way, Peter, before we published in JAMA, Merck came out to try to intimidate us to withdraw the paper. Once they heard How did they know? Did the reviewers give it to them for comment? The reviewers apparently communicated to them that there was this hatchet job on Vioxx coming, you know. And so they came to us and tried to intimidate us. And they also then, what I learned from the editor, then the editor, they tried to intimidate her, that they would sue JAMA, and it was unfounded. And as soon as we published the paper, and that What did they actually say to you guys? Well, they said that, you know, we did data dredging. (laughs) They they had all the lines. They basically said that we were hacks and didn't know how to- P-hacking, data dredging, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. all we did was basically review the data that was filed on the FDA. And by the way, some of the things that didn't get out in the public, there were other small studies that never really got in the spotlight that also showed the excess of heart attack. So the so signal- So did, did your JAMA was, study include a meta-analysis of those smaller ones as well as the original FDA- Yes. As the Vigor trial? Exactly. And we saw this consistent signal. you saw signal. this pattern. It wasn't a question. And we also saw a lesser signal for Celebrex. It was in the paper. But the one that was you know just so consistent and you couldn't deny it was- with Vioxx. And that was not just compared to naproxen, it was compared to other things, uh, and so including felt, placebo. And so your feeling at that point was the naproxen comparison is a red herring. And whether you're doing this against a placebo or Advil, and by the way, was there a belief at the time that just general ibuprofen had slight prevention or was neutral? Neutral. Neutral. Neutral at best. There wasn't any hint that naproxen afforded benefit or protection. So that whole premise was off base. And so we were talking about a difference of one in a hundred and absolute risk. Two in a hundred. Two, two in a hundred. So yeah. one in 50 additional. And at that point in time, because I think later on we knew more, but in 01, did you have a sense of which patients were the ones that were at risk? No, I think that we still don't know that, who was at risk. We do know that 80 million people took Vioxx, which mm-hmm. is a lot of people. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily those with hypertension or those with dyslipidemia. I mean, were we able to sort of stratify it at all? No. In fact, that's the hardest thing is that when there were all these lawsuits of people that had heart attacks, you know, Merck defended it saying, well, it could have been their hyperlipidemia and their high blood pressure. And it's very hard an individual person to ascribe the the hit to Vioxx. That's difficult because most people that have severe osteoarthritis are also having comorbidities that would put them at risk for heart attack. The signal kept showing up, though. Like when Kaiser looked at their patient base, database, they saw it everywhere it looked. It was a heart attack problem and stroke problem, by the way, but heart attacks especially. And the strokes were hypercoagulable strokes? As best we can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, when I did the 60-minute segment, brings me to that idea about we talked about, it was right after Vioxx withdrawal. And I was upset because Merck was claiming they did everything right. And I knew much better that that wasn't true. In fact, we had called this three years before and they still never took it seriously. And as you said, they could have just admitted there was a problem. It was in all their emails. It was clearly they knew about it. Wait, uh, there's evidence they knew before your paper? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I don't think I realized. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was, your paper came out in one. That was the shot across the bow. Then they just completely denied it, concealed data da, 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 until it became undeniable by 04. I didn't realize prior to 01, internally, they had seen the same signal. Absolutely. No, they had emails they recovered from the all the way back to from 99 when the FDA approved the drug, 2000, well before our paper. They because were they did make the argument in 99 that naproxen was risk lowering and that's why there was no signal. In, but that, yeah. yeah, in fact, the term signal was used at the uh, head scientific officer and all the people involved in the Vioxx development said, well, let's turn it on. Let's flip it. to The communications experts showed up and yeah. Yeah. No, the whole thing was just so incredibly contrived. 
And it was all clear that they were in this race with Pfizer, with Celebrex. They didn't want to lose it. $5 billion was on the line and whatnot. But when I went to 60 Minutes to discuss this right after the turbulence of the withdrawal, the interviewer, he had just had a stroke on Vioxx. He never revealed it on the show. I said, well, why don't you, you know, just like we're talking before we actually went on the air, I said, well, why didn't you tell people that? He says, well, I'm not part of the story. I said, well, you had a stroke. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. Ed Bradley, you know, I think there was a lot of hits out there. It's a shame because, you know, up until that time, Merck had been. What finally seen what finally been. sunk the ship in 04? Well, when they withdrew the drug, there was another new trial. And this one, again, the same exact signal. This was a phase four. This was a, yeah. I, actually, I think it was phase three for an expanded indication. Whereas the early one was in, you know, one condition, this was in another. It was a large trial. The heart attack thing was right there again. And they just couldn't deny it anymore, especially on top of everything they've been trying to suppress for years. So they just pulled the plug on it. But was there any ramification? No. That's actually, when you mention it, you know, why I, I never should have been involved with this. I regret it because. You do regret it? To oh, this day? A- absolutely. Because nothing ever happened. I mean, no one at Merck In other words, ever, you believe that had you not written the paper in 01, they still would have withdrawn it in 04? They might have because after we wrote the paper and published it, others started to come alive like Kaiser and others about this signal. So they, it was getting more and more undeniable. So I don't know that our paper, even though it was the first one and was in a high profile journal, I think they still would have had a hard time keeping that drug. Well, they, they might have done what you suggested, Peter, which is put on a warning and keep marketing, which is what they should have done. It was a good drug. But the problem was that the doses that they were recommending, certain people were getting exposed. And you say, well, two out of 100 is not a lot. But when you have tens of millions of people, no, it's, I mean, it's two, a lot. Yeah, one out of 50 absolute increase in risk for, for a hard outcome like mortality is a huge deal, especially if you can't know who that patient is. I mean, so this is where, again, I because I never, you know, I was in the middle of my residency when this was going on and I was a surgeon. So it's not like this was top of mind. I just had a personal interest because I remember using Vioxx and finding it so efficacious and finding it to be personally much better than Celebrex and much better than, you know, single day dosing. I think he took 50 milligrams once a day. I mean, it was like, you know, and I had just had a horrible back injury in 2001, which is actually a, another story where they'd operated on the wrong side and I had multiple trips to the OR. So I was really debilitated. And in the midst of a surgical residency, Vioxx was the saving grace for me. But my recollection was, oh, but there's a subset of patients in whom you could sort of carve out to not take it. And that would have been the interesting question. That would have been the clinical question, which is like, for example, like if you, if you look at drugs that cause birth defects, something like Avodart or Dutasteride or something like that, like don't take it if there's a pregnant woman nearby kind of thing becomes a very clear and obvious way. Not that that causes birth defects, but that interferes with androgens. I don't know. So it's interesting to hear you say that, that basically, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it almost sounds like you said, if you go back in time, you wouldn't have done it. No, because it wound up being a horrible phase in my career, the true nader. Not only during that time after the withdrawal were there threats from whether it was Merck or friends of Merck, you know, calling up saying, if you don't stop talking about this, you know, bad things are going to happen to you. I remember being out of town one night and my wife got a call like that. You better stop. You better tell your husband to stop saying things about Merck or you're going to it's hard it. for people to believe what you're saying, right? It sounds like the, some, the sort of thing you'd see in a mob movie. Yeah. No, it was the worst experience. And then I even had my own institution. Unbeknownst to me, the chairman of the board of Cleveland Clinic, a fellow named Malachi, who was the CEO of Invacare, but he and Gil Martin, the CEO of Merck, were best friends from Harvard Business School. And so he and the CEO of Cleveland Clinic were basically ganging up to suppress me and gag me. And also to turn on me. So I had my own institution. I had Merck against me. It was a nightmare. I mean, a veritable nightmare. But without redemption, when when Merck finally pulled the drug, you would think that, one, it would sort of give people pause to realize that this was, as you said, probably inevitable. And two, it was the right thing to do. 
unfortunately, it was too big a hammer for, you know, like yeah. I said, there, it, I was naive. But they were backed into a corner. No, they were, they were in a corner, but you know, to but, be able but nobody, to, but nobody came around, you know, to me, it, it's kind of nowadays, everybody talks about truth and, and fake and whatnot. But to me, then was the beginning of seeing that syndrome because here was truth and it was just being basically turned into fake news by Merck. And they had gone years of marketing a drug, mass marketing a drug. You couldn't turn on a TV set without seeing ads for Vioxx. And they never fessed up. And they just, every single patient case that went to court, they basically prevailed eventually, whether it was the original case or the appeals, by this whole inability to proof, for proof in an individual patient. So they didn't pay anything there was no was restitution no, whatsoever no, nothing that i know that's significant and most importantly the executives who oversaw this who knew exactly what they were doing they didn't go to jail they were never indicted there was never any charge so and no civil suits at all nothing nothing which is interesting it tells you something about how difficult it is when the complication is you is a ubiquitous disease you see it's different when you're dealing with well and of course we think of the examples that turned out to be wrong, right? Like the use of silicone breast implants and lupus. Well, it turned out to be incorrect, but you at least had a signal to talk about because lupus was so rare or what other connective tissue disorders they were talking about. But as you said, like, how can you possibly look at any individual and make that case probabilistically? You would need a very large trial to determine that. Oh yeah, I know. You can't single it out. It, it, it's almost impossible. If you had assays to show that this selectivity of the COX-2 inhibitor was prothrombotic, making a clot in a person, and that person then had a heart attack or stroke. But, you know, who had that? I mean, these were sudden events, and, and yeah. no one had a, a proof in that person that their clotting status changed from it the drug. Seems, it seems like that's got to be the most likely mechanism. Though. Oh, yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't... The mechanism of how these people went down is not elusive. But what's, you know, what's sad about this too, Peter, is I had known Roy Vagelos to some extent, I had the highest regard for this company. I We were doing trials with this company when it happened. And so just to see a company that was re viewed as one of the most ethical-minded companies, not just in pharma, but you know abroad, across all companies, to see it take these tactics of marketing, you know, it's really sad. But of course, that's many years ago. You know, that's 2004. We're 15 years later now. Yeah, but I can hear it in your voice, Eric. It's still quite traumatic. Yeah, it was almost the end of my career. You know, that's what precipitated leaving uh, Cleveland and fortunately, you know, coming to San Diego, which was the greatest thing ever. But who would have known for a year or two, it was a question of whether there would be a new position and whether it would be suited to things that I would want to do. So so how did San Diego, I mean, were you a pariah at the time? Yeah, you know, one of my people who I regarded in extraordinary, the Pope of cardiology, Gene Brownwald, he was trying to help me. He said, you know what, Eric, you're radioactive right now. And I was. And I even had people at Cleveland Clinic. The, by then, there was a new CEO and others who were charged to try to nuke me. That is, any place I interviewed uh, yeah. for a position, they were calling them and actively trying to, to uh, take me down. So ultimately, over that course of a year when I was looking to move, I started realizing I have to do this in stealth mode because, you know, I've got people who are trying to get me. And uh, fortunately, a very close friend of mine here in San Diego, who I'd known for decades, Paul Tierstein, who is at Scripps, and I had collaborated some with the people at Scripps Research. And so we started talking, they were excited about what I had a uh, vision for. And then I was ultimately recruited uh, in uh, fall of 2006. And what was the role they brought you into at that time? Because at the time, wasn't Scripps, I mean, it wasn't really a clinical powerhouse. It was a research powerhouse. Well, kind of both in some respects. The research- Was, the, was the affiliation with UCSD on the clinical? No, front? no. Purely Scripps Health. Scripps purely Clinic. Scripps Health, yeah. So Scripps Health was on the move. They had, Christian Gorder as the CEO had basically put together, stitched together many different Scripps entities into one called Scripps Health. They were and are completely different entity than Scripps Research. 
So TRSI, the Translational Research Institute, that was totally separate. So totally separate, although prior to 2000, year 2000, they were one entity, but it was Scripps Clinic then, not this big health system with, you know, multiple hospitals and 30 clinics and whatnot. So what I did was to come in to be a cardiologist at Scripps Clinic, but also to develop a new institute that was dedicated to translational research, particularly genomics. That's why I came here. And it was only, you know, within weeks, I realized, wait a minute, what about wireless? What about digital? Because you don't want to just rely on a genome, even though back in 06, there was tremendous... Now, what was Craig Ventner doing at that time? So Craig, he had the Ventner Institute in Maryland. He was also working in synthetic biology, had a synthetic biology company here. And I think he was aiming to develop another Ventner Institute in San Diego, but he as a pioneer of pushing the whole sequencing project, of course, in year 2000, announcing it with Francis Collins and Bill Clinton at the White House. But he had moved not just from sequencing, but also to writing the genome with synthetic biology. That was his interest at the time. I see. Got it. So I came here to try to make human genomics and genetics center stage for the two scripts institutions. Right. And you wanted to translate this as quickly as possible to basically patient care. Yeah, to change practice, which is we're still working on that. But that was the goal. And we basically very quickly, fortunately, were able to get a uh, big grant called the CTSA grant, one of the 57 now hubs of that in the country. And we're the only one that's not a university or without a medical school. But basically, Scripps Research is a storied institution with some of the best life science in the world, ranked number one in nature for innovation and influence above some of the very top known centers. So it has had a phenomenal track record and to work with them, this great brain trust of scientists, and to try to bridge that with this big clinical entity, Scripps Health, which is a dominant player in the San Diego region, a big region. For me, it was perfect. And basically the the big grant we were able to get led to an innovation space, you know, just to do whatever you think would be appropriate to make medicine better. And there's no shortage of ways we could do that. Now, you're also the editor-in-chief of Medscape. Is that right? Right, right. How did you get involved? And I think anybody listening to this who's ever gone onto Google and searched for something will notice Medscape is usually coming up with information. So what what is Medscape? Yeah, well, Medscape is the professional side for healthcare professionals of WebMD. The way I got into it was in the mid-90s, when the internet was kind of warming up, I started with a couple of friends, the heart.org, which was the first cardiovascular website for, for cardiologists and anyone working in this space. So we started that and, you know, it was all about getting great content, getting journalists. And um, it was, for many years, a big magnet for not just the information, but also a forum for education and for debates and whatnot. So ultimately, Medscape started to cover every specialty, and they acquired the heart.org. And in that acquisition, being the editor-in-chief of that, they ultimately asked me, would I be the editor-in-chief of Medscape? And so I've done that now for several years. It's been great. How much time does that take? I mean, that's you, you must have an editorial staff under you because it's such a voluminous. It is. I mean, it's like an encyclopedia. Yeah. No, they have an amazing crew of medical journalists, and they cover everything that moves in medicine. I don't do so much day-to-day. I set general direction. We have a monthly call to go over features that I usually try to introduce ideas for that. I do a lot of interviews. I try to find... Like, you know, this week was the uh, big Wall Street Journal issue with a Penn Medicine former dean taking on medical education today, saying that it was completely off base to nurture students on climate change or gun control or any social injustice. And of course, there was a revolt that, you know, and we're going to have a lot of that in Medscape. So I tried to bring up my, you know, when I first got involved, the, the website was much more pharma oriented. Yeah. And what I've tried to do is round that out with not just devices and medical education, but also, you know, the whole genomics and digital medicine and AI and all those how, sorts of things. How topics. big is the staff? Oh, gosh, there's probably over 30, 35 journalists. 
Ivan Oransky recently joined as the VP for editorial. He runs Retraction Watch, which is really formidable. But no, it's it's a big staff. It's a for profit or not for profit. Well, it's part of it, WebMD. It's, it's part of WebMD. Oh, okay. WebMD used to be a publicly traded company, but they were acquired a, about a year ago by a company called Internet Brand. So they're now a private but for profit company. Got it. I didn't realize that I should have known that, I suppose, but I didn't realize Medscape was under that umbrella. Yeah, and I've always tried to weave in the WebMD side because WebMD has a big reach to consumers, as you pointed out, to kind of go to search for lots of common things in medicine. And we don't do that enough. I'm hoping that over time we'll we'll see better crosstalk because we may have some really interesting things on on the Medscape side or the opposite on the WebMD, we don't get enough trying to get that mixed audience. It's funny that it's taken us this long to get to your your most recent book, but um, I think it was a worthwhile route to get here because I, I think that the story of Vioxx alone, I think is, um, well, I learned a lot because I, again, I think I knew parts of it, but I don't think I appreciated the severity with which you've paid a price. Mm. Fortunately, past tense and didn't hold. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, really and it sounds well. like it's worked out for the best. But oh, it's, but that's it's been that's phenomenal. That seems to be one of those experiences that falls in the category of you're probably better for it, but would be you'd never want to redo it. No, exactly. You know, you get much stronger. You learn that, learn who your friends are and aren't. And basically, I when I got here, it was like being in the witness protection program. And uh, you're starting all over. I remember I had this big lab where we're going to do all the sequencing and, you know, and I, I'm sitting in this big lab and I'm the only one in the lab and I got a lot of recruitment to do. Now we have just in our group, you know, well over a hundred people. We have one of the largest NIH grants in history to do all of us, the, the big million person participants, a diverse group that we're doing so much with over the years ahead. So, you know, things are really humming. So it's been great. So your book is called Deep Medicine, and the picture on the front really points to AI, but the book is about more than that. But I want to start with that. Now, let's assume for a moment that someone listening to this has heard the term AI but and sort of knows from science fiction movies what it kind of means, but that's the limit of the knowledge, right? So they don't maybe necessarily know the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence or those terms synonymous let alone how would that even factor into medicine and how do you separate out the sci-fi from what's how already happening, right? And to, you know, what you think of Catholics like. So take that in any order you like. Well, I mean, I think the problem with AI is it's been around the concept since the 50s, 1950s, and it's diffuse. Yes, there's lots of sci-fi and movies and misunderstandings, but what we're talking about now is a specific subtype of AI, which got its birth just over 10 years ago called deep learning, neural networks that allow for inputs, and they could be millions, billions of data points, could be images, could be speech, could be text. And then it goes through these layers of artificial neurons, which are not very much like neurons, but nonetheless, they can distinguish features progressively as they go through this this network, and then you get outputs. And what's remarkable about this era and why it recently won the Turing Prize for Jeffrey Hinton and his colleagues from University of Toronto. But the the thing that's so... The Turing Prize being the, basically the Nobel Prize for computer science. Yes, I should have mentioned that. Exactly. The reason why this is such a big advance in medicine, the biggest advance I've ever seen as a student of medicine for many decades now, but it's so big because you can take, particularly now, images, and you can get accurate definition of the image better than experts, doctors. So whether it's radiologists or dermatologists, pathologists, cardiologists, I mean, you go down the list, ophthalmologists, and you will see studies now to show superiority of accuracy, or at least as good through a machine. Now, to be clear, this is in initial recognition, not comparison. I mean, I think again, this is an area I don't know very much about, Eric, but the last time I thought about this and did some reading about this, I, I came away with the impression that if you took an MRI of a person and you showed, so this first time this person's getting an MRI, you get the best radiologist to look at it. You get the best computer to look at it. The computer still struggled for macro context. It still didn't even realize that was the liver per se, but it could certainly with greater fidelity and resolution once told that was the liver identify and maybe be more 
clear about, well, what's a cyst versus what's a hemangioma versus what's a hepatoma. So it had superiority there. It also had superiority when it came to serial studies. So, you know, Mrs. Smith had a chest X-ray a year ago. She has a cough now. She has another chest X-ray. Is there a difference? But am I right in my recollection? No, no. Actually, I'm really glad you you put some anchoring on that because what we have, deep learning is in many respects extraordinary, but it's very narrow. So if I say, find me pulmonary nodules in a chest X-ray, that's where I say it can be superior. And clearly the best is the combination, the synergy, the symbiosis of what the machine can, quote, see versus what the the, the doctor could see. So... Yes, it's it's a very narrow thing, but what we're talking about here is there's so many mistakes in medicine because things are missed or are inaccurate, and you know this extends through pathology and every different specialty. Yeah, your your thesis is not. I mean, many people have said to me when they talk about this sort of loosely that the radiologist is the first doctor on the chopping block. That's not really your thesis. No, I actually think that's completely wrong. Yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton said that once, and uh, I think he, he'll ultimately regret it. The point being is that it basically tees it up. That is, you get a different complementary read of something, and that helps for speed and accuracy, and it could have ultimately lower cost, and it could ultimately improve medicine. The thesis of deep medicine is if we lean on machines more, in many respects, we can get into that. But if we do that more, we can free up to have time with patients. And we could get the doctor-patient relationship back to where it ought to be, where it was, you know, some 40 years ago. That's the main premise that is unique about the book in which, you know, I really build up to deep empathy with the last chapter. But the, the real thing that's different now is that we have lots of promise, lots of potential for AI, we haven't actualized that. We haven't proven it for the most part. You know, one of the only randomized trials to date is in colonoscopy because a lot of polyps, particularly if they're flat or sessile or yeah. small, are, are missed. Yeah. And it's very much operator dependent, how much time they take to do a thorough colonoscopy. And so now there's a Chinese randomized trial that shows, hey, you know, if you use deep learning machine vision, you can pick up polyps that are routinely missed. And so... Then people say, okay, so what? Maybe the ones that are missed are not important. Well, you know, that's that's where we are today. That's the study, is you look at the denominator of the missed versus the not missed, the machine caught versus not, and what's the prevalence? Because if the prevalence of pathology in them is at least the same, yeah. you could argue they well, shouldn't that, be missed. That's and, what, the, and it might be higher if it's Cecil. Yeah, so you know, 20% of polyps were picked more, were picked up by machine vision, and then we still don't know how much of that were true disease likely. I've always felt the field, if radiology is the first pit stop on this journey, I've always felt like the ICU needed to be a very close second. How much is really being done there? Because A, it's the obviously the most data-rich environment after radiology. Radiology also, of course, informing the ICU. But in terms of just raw numbers, coming out about a patient, you know, if you think about a patient on a ventilator with, you know, CVVHD and like you pick, pick every device strapped up to a patient. It's not the same as a formula one car, but you're, you're in the ballpark of that much data. Yeah. And you're touching on one of the big deficiencies of AI and deep learning today, which is multimodal data. So when you have all these inputs right. of varied types, you know, not just their, uh, vital signs, but, you know, could be machine vision of their facial recognition. It could be, you know, so many different parts about that person, no less their prior electronic record. And we don't do well with that because deep learning today is, as I say, narrow task. It's like, you know, what's in this eye ground for ophthalmologists? Yeah. Is this a diabetic retinopathy? Yeah. Is this something else? So the ability to take many layers of data, which would be the ICU story, is in the early stages, even more so than the image recognition. Yeah. What realistically, where do you think that is in terms of, again, uh, caveating it with the, it's always going to take longer than we think it is. Is this something where, I don't know, in 10 years or in 20 years, going to an ICU will afford a patient the luxury of a true supercomputer that's basically assimilating 
the CVVHD data, with the ventilator data, with the Swan GANS data, like stuff that, as you point out, like it's, it's n- even the most analytical physician can't really recognize the patterns that are deep within all of those data. Well, you, you just touched on with that statement, the essence of why we need AI support, not just in an ICU patient, but in every patient. There's more data than we can handle, especially when you say people are wearing sensors, they're going to be wearing more, people are going to have their genome sequence, or they already have a, a genome chip or array, a microbiome of the gut. I mean, no less, all their records, not just the one healthcare place that they happen to be visiting that moment. Uh, so this flood of data per person, no less the intensive data collection in an ICU setting, this is overridden human capability. We need machines. We have to fess up that we can't do this. But we also have to acknowledge that we're not there yet. Now, so when are we going to get there? Well, you know, Fei Fei Lee and the group at Stanford has done ICU work, machine vision, to see whether... Is it single machine or is it integrated? Their studies have been mainly single, whereby, for example, they're looking to see risk of extubation so that you don't have to have a nurse in the room all the time that what's going on with that patient that they're going to self-extubate or... Others have looked at, you know, likelihood of sepsis or different pieces of the story, but no one has integrated it all yet today. And I think that's where it's headed. We're seeing these hybrid models of bringing the data together. But, you know, a lot of the problem with this field has been way out of bound hype of where it can go. And if I, you know, when I did the research in the book, which involved a few years of work cumulatively, I spoke to a lot of the real gurus in the field. And they made it clear that, you know, we are going to get there eventually, but we're, we're not there yet. That is the challenge because when you think about other big breakthroughs that we look back on, we don't realize that they were more discoveries than creations sometimes. So for example, look at germ theory, right? This is, again, it's something we take for granted today. And it's hard to believe there was a day when you wouldn't wash your hands before operating on a patient or you wouldn't wear sterile gloves. So we acknowledge how that transformed medicine in a step function manner. But two things are a little bit missed when we contrast it. One is we didn't have to build it. We accepted it and discovered it. And two, it didn't happen overnight. Like there's still a generation that it takes to implement these things And so that's the best case scenario, right? It doesn't get any better than that. This is something that has to be built. This is almost, this is, I can't think of an example. Maybe I'm wrong. And and if anyone's going to think of it, it's you. But is there an example before when we had the idea and the promise, and then we set out to engineer the solution building into it? So for example, I'll give you, I'll give you a failed example, (laughs) which is the EMR, Mm, right? Totally failed. So is it like literally the worst thing on the face of the earth? I heard you once talk about this and I think, I think it was you actually, but maybe it wasn't, but I'm going to give you credit for it. But (laughs) I think thank you, you you best summarize it by saying, look, the EMR was created as a billing solution, Mm -hmm. not a clinical solution. Absolutely. And I I couldn't agree with you more, but there's an example of, okay, we have a problem. Medical records are so cumbersome, so voluminous, although really they're just a two dimensional problem. It's really not, it's three dimensions. If you include time, I would say. And we now have computers, quote unquote. So computers will solve the problem. Let's build it. Well, one, it took a lot longer than people expected. It took much longer to implement it. And it sucks much more than people could have ever imagined it could suck. When I think of those examples, I I keep saying, is there a positive story? Is there a great case study in medicine where the engineering solution lived up to its expectations? I think you nailed it. I don't believe there is one. This is a unique story that's, you know, being written as we speak. It's it's so different than we have a technology and we just want to implement it. This is one that uh, there's a lot of construction that's still required. We know what the house is likely going to look like when it's built, but we're, you know, still in the foundation stage. Do you think that these are problems that are going to be solved by the giants? Is IBM... Is Google, I mean, are these the are these the entities that figure this out, or is this going to be solved in more of a pharma model where the early discovery and the 
early stage, you know, even though stage one, the safety trials are done by small companies that ultimately get acquired by rolled up into larger companies. So, you know, I mean, today, like these, the Mercs and the Pfizer's of the world aren't really doing drug discovery anymore. They've decided we're going to outsource that to more nimble companies. And basically the private markets now subsidize that while the public markets subsidize late stage drug development. Do you think that's the way this is going to be? Or do you think this is going to have to start and finish within the behemoth companies that have their enormously deep pockets? I think this is a story of innovation from the outside. I think it's very different than what you're seeing now with you know, the consolidation in pharma and outsourcing. Here you see the big titans like Google and Microsoft, Amazon, and the rest of them. They all recognize this is their greatest opportunity for growth and also some a, a noble mission of, of improving health. So you have that group, you have startups, that are, there's no shortage of those. And you also have some governments like in China, in the UK, and other places that are nurturing this, that are investing big in this area. So, you know, I think this combined force of multiple entities is where we're going to see this, you know, really take off. It's starting to happen much more in China out of need, that is... The implementation is way ahead of what's going on in the U.S. because they have so few. What are some examples? Well, the radiologists, whereas here, we're just starting to get a bunch of FDA-approved algorithms for reading various types of scans. They already have that widespread throughout China. They already are doing, you know, many things on the, well, you know, we here, the only FDA consumer approved or cleared is the Apple Watch for heart arrhythmia, a deep learning algorithm for atrial fibrillation, whereas... So, so explain how that works. Let's use that example yeah. because that's near and dear to everybody's wrist. And I see you're wearing your Apple Watch there as well. So let's just say you went into the Apple store today for the very first time and you bought an Apple Watch. Okay, so first of all, it's on the back surface of the wrist, the volar surface of the wrist. And what is it shining through? And I assume it's shining it onto the veins in the back of your arm? Yeah, it? no, it's, it's picking up optically each heart rate. And you can see the light that yeah. it's used. And for the deep learning algorithm, which actually was first cleared by a startup, a live core, and then a year later, Apple, which they didn't even acknowledge that they had been a year after the first. But nonetheless, on their watch, they get heart rate. So at rest, and then when you are active. And then they basically, for you, it has your data whereby when you have heart rate at rest, that's off track for you, it says, hmm, get a cardiogram. And you get a one lead cardiogram when you press the, the crown on the EC. And you get a good quality cardiogram. And then if it has atrial fibrillation, it's Which also- Which lead does it most closely approximate on the 12 lead? It's a lead one. You get a cardiogram read- for atrial fibrillation, which is one thing it's pretty good for that. I was about to say, not to minimize that, but AFib seems like about the easiest thing to pick up because of the irregularity of it, right? Yeah, although there, are, there is some false positives and negatives because sometimes the P waves are that you're, you're looking to be absent, you know, sometimes you can get faked out. And so it's reasonably good. And, you know, it's in the 90 plus percent accuracy level, but it's all about the base theorem of for people more who, information well for people who are not risk a lot of people have an apple watch who are you know young and have zero risk of atrial fibrillation and they get a cardiogram and gets them anxious and they may even get workups by a cardiologist so this is a problem where we have marketing of an algorithm the first deep learning algorithm how in long medicine. does it take by the way um to learn a person well enough that it would be willing to make a recommendation like that oh just a matter of hours Wow. Or certainly by a couple of days, it's got it down. Okay. But yeah, I mean, you know, your heart, resting heart rate by the accelerometers, it knows that you're not moving. Yep. And hmm, why did your resting heart rate used to be 60? Why is it 100 something? And then it'll tell you to get a cardiogram. But, and it can't make any other diagnosis. It can't diagnose any ventricular rhythm. Not now. Or atrial tachycardia or anything else. Ultimately, it should be able to, but those algorithms haven't really been validated yet. But and ultimately, you know, now I use a six lead cardiogram. It isn't on the watch, but you can just do that with sensors and put it on the leg. And wait, wait, how do you do that? That's interesting. Yeah, you know, it's basically half the size of a credit card. Where, then, where do you get this? Well, this is it's an aftermarket product, or no? It's actually marketed now by a live core, the one that came with this ECG on the watch first. They actually put it on the Apple Watch, but it was their algorithm. 
they came up with a six lead, which um, you then put that on your leg, your left leg, and then you get six all limb lead. And you do this with your patients as well? Yeah, I, every patient. When I see them, instead of just taking their pulse, I also do a six lead cardiogram. It's been remarkably insightful because it's free. It takes a second. And then I can really be much more certain about if they have an arrhythmia, but also diagnose conduction system abnormalities. So, so it's accurate enough that you can measure your intervals perfectly. Oh my gosh, it's, it's, the quality is amazing. Yeah, I mean, the six lead. Now, can you send them home with the same kit and then can they get a six lead on themselves at home and let you see the data? They could. I haven't done that yet, but that's probably where this is headed. The reason why this is actually funny, you mentioned it, Peter, you can even do your own stress test with this. Yeah, of course. In fact, you could do a real stress test, which is in the actual (laughs) environment under which you need to be stressed. Yeah, I did that the other day. I I did a rest ECG, and then I got on a bicycle, stationary bicycle, and went really hard. And then I just after I I got off and did a six lead again, so I said, wow, you can do a stress electrocardiogram, high quality, six lead, and never go near a medical clinic. Where's the output? Where are you seeing the output? Oh, on your phone. Okay. And you can make it a PDF and send it off to your doctor. It makes it automatically, yes. Huh. Yeah, it's pretty cool. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, that strikes me as proof of concept now. Yeah, well, and that's that's where we're going to get, like you alluded to, when are we going to get all the heart rhythm abnormalities diagnosed and the heart conduction, you know, which is a precursor to arrhythmia so that's where we're headed because one lead it's hard to do that but when you have all the limb leads in fact with ai you could impute all 12 leads you don't even need to get the other six leads so pretty soon we're going to see that six lead become really valuable entry for what's going on in a person's heart in fact mayo clinic just published a series of papers on 12 lead cardiograms that you could get heart function you could predict from the cardiogram whether they're going to have atrial fibrillation you can get the potassium level of the blood through that wow i mean the amount of data that's sitting in this pattern which we can't see is amazing well think about the number of times i see this once a month and my practice is really small so if i'm seeing this once a month let's extrapolate to how many times this happens in the united states the blood hemolyzes slightly on a blood draw and the potassium comes back at 5.5. Oh, yeah, or higher even. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you don't know what to do. Right. Well, imagine you had that EKG, you wouldn't have to panic because every time that happens, you have to call that patient, send them into the ER, get a blood draw, confirm what you know is likely true, which is the stupid sample hemolyzed. Their potassium is really 4.7. But imagine you didn't have to do that. You could just say, oh, yeah. I mean, it's- push this button on your watch. That exemplifies That's a great example. Exemplifies what we can't see, but having a machine trained by you know a million cardiograms, what it can see. And in the book, in Deep Medicine, I have a chapter, it starts out with that story. How did they discover the potassium story? Something we can't we can tell when potassium is really high yeah, with the tall yeah, T waves, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know. But we can't get to the decimal point. Right. We can't distinguish between 4.9, which is do nothing, and 5.6, which is you better be careful. Right. And that's what machines are good for. And and we're going to be seeing a lot more of that kind of stuff. That is, the eye-opening thing to me is to learn about all the things that we we humans can't do, that machines can be trained to do, and they're just going to get better over time. So if you, do you wear a Dexcom sensor? Regularly? I have, not regularly. I'm, I'm not a diabetic, but I have, and I've learned a lot from it. I've, you know, I've tried Dexcom and the Libra. I mean, I've, I've really found this glucose thing because of how it inter- interacts with what you eat, with your sleep, with well, your physical activity. It's, it's amazing. It's, yeah, it, it really is. You know, people ask me why I still wear it because I'm not diabetic and even my patients, so about a third of my patients to a half my patients wear this, mm. none of whom have diabetes. Wow. And I always ask them for 90 days. If every one of my patients would wear it for 90 days, at least I'd be happy. And then we could decide. But what's in, what invariably happens is people realize, the, they go through the following cycle, which is, Peter, you've been wearing this thing for four or five years. Haven't you already figured out what to eat and what not to eat? And I say, well, yes and no, but it's more complicated because like, for example, let me show you this. I have not eaten anything since 4 p.m. yesterday. Wow. It's 11.30, so I'm coming up on 20 hours of no food. Yeah. Look at the variability in my glucose for the last 12 hours. It's been as high 
it peaked at 118, mm. which was, I peaked at 118, which was right after a workout this morning. And by the way, it was just weight training. It wasn't like high intensity interval training. If it's high intensity interval training, it's going to go much higher. Now it's sitting at 94. And you'd think, well, if knowing that it's 94, like if I ate a bagel right now, could I predict what it would go to just knowing it's 94? The answer is not a chance. You see, just knowing it's 94 isn't enough to tell me my response to the bagel. I have to know how much glycogen I have. I have to know how much cortisol I have. I have to know how much insulin I have. Like there's so many variables. And that's why four or five years later, there's nothing about this that is boring to me because I'm constantly learning a new physiologic experiment. I mean, if there's anything that's ripe for AI, it would also be CGM coupled with other data. So in other words, I don't think the CGM data as a, as the input feed would be sufficient. You would have to constantly be pairing it with your activity and other sensors. Because if we had like, if you had the cortisol sensor and the lactate sensor, I mean, that starts to become remarkable predictive power. And when you could get to the point where, because this is my dream, I want to know, can I eat that right now or not for my parameters? So this is my pipe dream is I want to be able to say, go into the algorithm and tell it your desired average glucose, your desired variability. So I want an average glucose that's below a hundred milligrams per deciliter or below 110 milligrams per deciliter. I want a standard deviation that doesn't exceed 15 milligrams per deciliter. And now you tell me what I can eat. Spend the first month watching me eat, learning how my body responds to every different food and go from there. I mean, directionally speaking, how long would it take to get us there? We're getting there. I mean, we're chipping away at that. So the gut microbiome is a big part of the story too. And I know you're such a proponent of this and I am, I call myself a gut skeptic. Because, well, why would I say that? I certainly don't disregard the importance of that. I think I'm waiting to see a great example of how I can use it outside of like the really clear clinical ones. Like certainly knowing how to change the gut microbiome in the context of C. diff colitis is profound. It seems very likely that something about the gut changes in patients with diabetes who undergo gastric bypass. That seems to really suggest, but it could be as high as the duodenum. And the most compelling evidence I've seen is that it's actually the change. It's the duodenal bypass that specifically gives them this incredible remission out of the gate, more so than the lower GI tract. But I think most of my skepticism comes from the fact that it's not clear to me what to do with all those data, which may be exactly your point, that when I see patients constantly show up to me with their gut sequence and they say, well, look at this pathology state here. And I say, well, first of all, I don't know that that's a pathology state. And if it is a pathology state, is taking a probiotic the answer? I don't have any evidence that that's the case either. No. So is it, is it more a readout state or is it a form, is it a malleable state that we directly interfere with? Right. So those are all important questions. I think the real insight here is that up until when Aaron Siegel and his group at Wiseman Institute in Israel, up until they did what now has to be seen as a classic study. This was the cell metabolism paper from about a year ago? Well, th- is, there was a paper in Cell, 2015, which was really the seminal work. And now there's been several more, and it's been replicated by many others. They took now thousands of people, healthy, like yourself, and they went ahead and got gut microbiome, but they also got exact same amount of food at the exact same time. They also got all their labs and, you know, every piece of data they could get on these people. And they found that you could predict if they had a bagel, which ones are going to have and what level of glucose spikes they're going to see. And they, they found that so many spikes, you know, even very significant spikes, 160, 180, 200 in healthy people with no sign of diabetes. And how, how durable do you think the knowledge is from the sequence? So for example, like if you sequenced that patient Monday morning at 9 a.m., how much do we know that Friday at 5 p.m., the data are still relevant? Assuming you could even, because you can't get the data in real time. But... Right, so they didn't do any DNA sequencing. 
And of course, that wouldn't change. So we don't know the genomic side of this, but we do know the microbiome, unless you do something significant like Oh, no, sorry. I didn't mean their DNA. I meant the DNA of the bacteria. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. The DNA of the microbiome is pretty darn stable everywhere you look at it, unless you change a radical change in your diet, like change fiber content, or you take antibiotics. But it's very stable from day to day. I see. So you would say that, look, Peter, only if the patient does a course of antibiotics, do we need to recheck them Yeah, or yeah. make a radical dietary change? But if a person's in quasi steady state, you could sequence them every quarter and basically update your pretest probabilities of what that, the distribution is. That's right. And another tier of complexity, because it's good that you're a skeptic on this, but early on, these various companies that would do microbiome assessment, they just said how much you have of this bacteria or that bacteria. It was like a density of bacteria. It turns out that you touched on it. If you sequence the bacteria, the changes in that bacteria species sequence is is just as important as the density of the type of bacteria. So this is not easy. It's expensive to do it right. And we've and already seen it. a big fraud on this front quite recently, right? Yeah, that you biome. You biome. They is basically the Theranos of this space. It yeah, seems like. well, they they were billing people illegitimately, and they were only reporting on density of bacteria. I don't know that they're reporting. So they weren't object fraud. It was just bad practices. Yeah, I, I don't think they were doing things wrong with respect to the microbiome density, which is very rudimentary. They didn't do sequencing. Uh, they did basically a bacterial density of... I mean, I found them to be the most useless company in the history of civilization <laughs> because back in 2012, 2011, I was, I mean, at least acting like I was on the forefront of this, trying to understand it and ordering these sequences on myself and all my patients. And I don't understand how this company stayed in business. I mean, they, they didn't, but... They couldn't run a sequence to save their lives. Well, yeah, I think the biggest thing is they were fraudulently billing uh, people, yeah. uh, double billing, triple billing, you know, all that sort of thing. That's what got them into, you know, basically collapse mode. I don't know enough about their sequencing. I mean, I always found Larry Smarr's stuff to be the most interesting because Larry's doing it at a level that you couldn't do commercially. Yeah, so shotgun sequencing where you do true metagenomics, you know, there are only certain labs like the one I mentioned in Wiseman here in San Diego the Knight Lab does metagenomics that is K N yeah K N I G H T Robert Knight so these are the centers that are doing it right that are sequencing each species of every organism that's found and we now know that though that sequence is is equally as important as the type of bacteria so that's the sort of data now the other thing you're bringing up that's really important is we have no idea how to manipulate the gut microbiome. The only thing we know is a fecal transplant in certain people with, you know, pseudomembranous colitis, C. difficile. Outside of that, we don't have, we have crapsules that are being made that are being tested. So I think you and I definitely see probably more closely on this than, than I would have guessed initially, because we agree that at this point, it's, it's an output of data, not an input to manipulate necessarily. Right, right. So... I probably need to go back and look at the Weissman paper again because I don't think I've looked at it in over a year. And my view was, which is probably incorrect, by the way, that CGM and dietary logging would have been sufficient. So what I really want to do is go back and look at that paper and see what the gut biome added above those things. Right. Which right. I'm guessing there there is something there. To yeah, you know, there is. And it, it, we need more. I mean, basically right now is you could predict if you had all the data and the right algorithms, you could predict which foods you'll spike from. And then this was taken to another level by the group in London, King's College, led by Tim Spector. He brought in all these twins from all over the country, identical twins. So they had their gut microbiome, and they also put in a line to a vein to get blood samples for triglycerides. Yep. And they saw the same thing. Which, which by the way, you could get out of a sensor. You, you, could, could, you, could, you could Ultimately. Yeah. yeah. We don't have one yet. No, and, th and you know why I mentioned lactate earlier? If you have real-time lactate, you are estimating with really great precision mitochondrial oxidation. Now you understand fuel partitioning. You see, to me... If, if you asked me a year ago, how would you want to best estimate fuel partitioning? I'd say, oh, it's tough because you got to have somebody basically walk around with a respirator or something that can measure oxygen consumption and CO2 production. But I think lactate's telling you that. I think if you really know how to calibrate lactate, you can estimate fat oxidation versus glycolysis. 
and uh, or glycolysis through to lactate. And so all of a sudden you now get into this. So the reason that right now my glucose is 94, but if I ate a bagel, it would go to like 104 is because I'm so glycogen depleted because I haven't eaten in 20 hours and I've worked out very hard or at least for a long enough duration. Conversely, it's not uncommon after dinner. Let's say you have dinner, you have a glucose spike up to 120 and then it comes back down to 90, 94 you eat that same bagel, you'll go higher. Well, a very important input into predicting that is knowing glycogen stores and insulin sensitivity of the muscle and all these other things. So what I need to better get is how many different phenotypes, macro phenotypes of gut biome are there that really matter? Right. The bigger picture though, I agree with all your point and it'd be nice to see a lactate sensor that's tested at scale and is accurate. It, you know, it took a while to get that at, at, for glucose and we're at the earliest stages on the lactate, but there's still a lot of naysayers here and I understand their perspective. And that is, so what? So what if your glucose goes to 180 or your lactate goes to this or your triglycerides go to that? The point is, do we know that changing that they're keeping everything nice, level, keel. You, know, you don't think the diabetes literature has made it clear enough that normalizing glucose and insulin is beneficial? Mm, not enough, no. Really? The only way you can get at this. Inferentially, yes. But you know what? We've oh, 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 you're saying I can tell the story that a glucose of 120 is better than 180 because I have clinical trial data to demonstrate that all day long. And I can even tell you that how you achieve that matters. Right. But you're saying, I don't have the data to tell you that 100 is better than 110. No, no. I, another way to put it is, I don't have the data to show that if you wear a sensor for X number of time, 90 days in your case, or forever, or a week, that your learning about avoidance of glucose spikes changes your prognosis. We don't know that. And the same thing for triglycerides, which, by the way, they don't correlate. And I'm, 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 we're learning that each person's individual response throughout their day is so incredibly unique. And we're learning some of the factors. We, I don't even know. We know all the factors that influence that. You've mentioned, of course, glycogen stores and physical activity and the microbiome. And, and, with, and cortisol, in my experience, plays stress. a staggering no role. No question. Stress. I mean, you know, just, just if you get an intermittent intervening cold, no less stress, you know, in your, in your family, your life, whatever experience. So, yeah, this is a really interesting area. We're learning about ourselves. It's like, you know, know thy, thyself sort of thing. We're in the early stages. And I see the, the skeptics. I understand their perspective. I think that we have to prove it. I lean where you are, which is why, why not have this information? I've learned a lot about it myself, no less the feel from it. But I think we have to admit that we got a ways to go. What do you think's significant blind spot in medicine today? At the macro uh, level or at, uh, at any level? No, I think the biggest blind spot is how poor we are in diagnosis no less in treatment. I, I mean, I think that when you really look hard at the data, what's amazing, Peter, is you see all these clinical trials that declare, you know, a triumph and they're helping three out of a hundred people. I mean, a great example is statins, that, you know, primary prevention of statins, that, if not the number one, close to the number one class of drugs that are used today. And you see that out of a thousand people for primary prevention, 988 derive no benefit for five years of taking a statin and 12 out of a thousand get benefit. So whether you look at the diagnosis where, you know, if a doctor- but, but That's another topic I know that we may disagree on. My view on that has always been that because the time course of atherosclerosis is so long, you know, it's a disease that begins in infancy. Sure, we sure. certainly know from, you know, the starry stuff of the, you know, the seventies that, you know, basically by the time you're 18 years old, you've, most people have a stage three lesion at that point that the challenge with studying primary prevention is you could never study it long enough to really see where those curves start to diverge. Well, no, they, they diverge, but the question is, are they going to keep diverging? And, you know, most of the benefit starts to kick in right around 18 months. And yes, they're still slightly diverging, you know, after five years, but we don't have any data beyond that. What I guess what I should restate that is that we don't have any proof that more you know, you can suggest that instead of 18 out of 1,000 people benefit, yeah, that it goes to 36. Exactly. But what My, about the 970 that don't derive yeah, benefit? Yeah, no, 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 that, that's fair. I think the, the point is 
do you believe the Mendelian randomizations? Or do you think that the Mendelian randomizations have artifacts in them, which any Mendelian randomization will have an artifact if that which changes the variable of interest also changes something else that yes. you don't know. That's always that's that's the blind spot of the Mendelian randomization. No, they're they're a neat way to get a readout, but they're not perfect. You know, I think that whether you look at diagnosis, where you know, if you take people who have died under a doctor's care and you say, "Why did that person die? What was the cause of death?" Forty percent of doctors say, "I absolutely know the answer." Are wrong. Forty percent. That's how many it autopsy are show a different reason for the death as what was pre mortem. Wow. If you that, add, that's that's a that's a that's yeah. a big gap. Yeah. If you ask doctors to make a diagnosis, if they don't think about it in the first five minutes, five minutes is ninety five percent accurate. But if they don't, it doesn't come to mind in the first five minutes. It drops down to twenty four percent accuracy. Basically, what we have is type one system, type one thinking, system one thing, I should say, at Kahneman's work. And we just are reflexive. We don't reflectively go over anything. We don't have time. We don't simulate all the data. We can't because it's so much. And so we have to basically, the whole, the big whole is acknowledge that we can do far better. And it can't all be through human support. We need help. Do you think there's any area where, I think you've made a compelling case that machine plus human should be better than human. Mm -hmm. Eventually it will be. I mean, I think even in radiology today, it should be. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hopefully critical care would be an amazing place where machine plus human should be better than human. Do you think that there are extremes on either way? Do you think there are places where humans will always be better than machines plus humans? Yes. And that's in being human, which is the bond. You know, just like our conversation, this deep conversation, it's really uh, illustrates the human connection. We don't have those kind of conversations in seven minutes or 10 minutes with a patient. You can't. And uh, you can't get to know a person's life history. That's never going to get really digitized. Mm. Story, their story. We interrupt patients within 18 seconds. From li We don't listen. So the point being is that machines... That's the, what we don't want machines. They don't have context. They're not going to be able to truly understand all the nonverbal communication and the real issues of a person that are deep. And that's where the humanity, we need to bring it back. I mean, the essence of medicine is that, and it's been lost. It's become this big business and it's- Do you worry really, about the, um, I don't know, if, well, it's not really a brain drain, but do you worry that the war for talent has shifted? And back when you went into medicine, it's probably safe to assume you were one of the best students in your high school, the best student in college. Like it would have been skimming at the very, very top of the pyramid of students. Is that still the case today? Or has, I mean, you've already alluded to a number of things that I've seen. Luckily, I don't experience them just on the nature of my practice because it's private. But I mean, these stories you tell, I know so well, the doctor that gets seven minutes to see a patient and in that seven minutes, six minutes is typing into an yeah. EMR, the moral distress and the absolute erosion of a belief in what you're doing is a huge cause of burnout amongst physicians. And I don't understand, like, if you're the top student in college and you're interested in life sciences, why you'd pick medicine today, unless you had a profound confidence that you could carve a path distinct from what most are probably going to do. I mean, you, you, you have to be an optimist, I think, is to, to pursue medicine today. Do you worry that it's going to be hard to recruit the most talented kids out of college into medical school? Well, I'm hoping it won't be, but, you know, I do hear constantly friends who are doctors who tell their kids don't go into medicine yes i hear that and i mean that, that's really bad because here is the, the ultimate profession for sense of really helping people and then you have the people who are in it saying it's horrible and as you know peter the physician burnout no less all clinician burnout is at peak and why is that? It's because they become data clerks and and they're squeezed for the time. They can't care for people when you don't have time. So this is, of course, going back to that main thesis of the gift of time. We can get that. But I think we have to restore medicine the way it was in order to attract 
the talent that you're referring to. And I think it's doable. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require a lot of activism, which we haven't had that much of in medicine. Yeah, this is something doctors are quite ill-equipped to do, it we're, seems. We're seeing the light on activism. The, the gun control, NRA, really brought it out when they said, stay in your lane. This is when the AMA said a physician should be asking a patient if they own a gun. It was, a, it, that... it was American College of Physicians. Okay. They published it in the Annals of Internal Medicine last fall. And then NRA said, you know, the, they, these doctors you know, should stay in their lane. And then you had all the doctors came out, one of them, Judy Melanick, saying, this is my fucking lane. And, you know, it went everywhere. It went viral. Right. The idea being, if doctors are going to be killed potentially by patients, it's not an well, unreasonable question to well, say. That, that and caring for all the gunshot victims. Uh, yeah. You know, the murder And room, the suicides. Pathos, and the suicide, Which not, is probably the greatest cause of gun. Yeah, yeah. You've got a, both suicides and homicides and mass killings and, you know, AR. 15s and all this stuff so you know the fact that this was taboo that doctors didn't weren't allowed to talk to patients and they weren't allowed to do research i mean there was no research in this area so this was a void that now has brought out a lot of the activists and social media and it's this new era of young physicians a lot of them women and we're seeing activism like never before. I wrote about it in the New Yorker recently about this and you know, should doctors organize and this what we're seeing. It is happening. And the hope is that we're going to see an organization take hold where all doctors can join as well as ultimately patient advocates and, and others and that we will turn this around because this is the biggest concern I have, Peter, is that we're going to see AI kick in more and more over the years. But what will it do if the administrators, who are the overlords, who are overrepresented as compared to the people taking care of patients, if they keep the squeeze on, we're just going to see things get worse. So we have to override that. And the only way we're going to do that and turn inward and get the humanity back in medicine is to have doctors organize and the gravitas of a million doctors in America all being part of one entity it could be enormous. You know, and this this gets to another problem within medicine that I alluded to earlier, which is the patients aren't footing the bill based on the system directly and therefore demand in a, in a demand-based system. So if it's not a demand-based system, it doesn't matter. Like in other words, in the NHS or the Canadian system, the patient is not footing the bill, but they're also not driving the demand. The demand is budget set. But in the US where you have this paradox it also means the patient's voice doesn't matter. And that's the irony of it, right? So it's the opposite of the DC license plate, you know, which is taxation without representation. It's like no taxation and no representation. And that's why I don't, I worry that patients can't be the ones to drive this change, which they should be able to. Yeah. Like the patients should demand this change, but because they're not the ones writing the checks, to feed that $3.8 trillion machine directly. They're only doing it indirectly. In other words, they don't get to control it, right? They're paying their taxes and their employers are withholding it, but they it's not the same as saying, here's my dollar, go and do this thing with it. Yeah, no, I, that's why if you get the doctors to, to come together to start this, and the sole purpose is the patient-doctor relationship. It's not about better reimbursement or all the other trade guild activities, but rather it's about, we want to fix this relationship and bring the humanity back in medicine. Then we start to see, you know, that the ability for that patient interest to be recognized because now all you have is you got a lot of patient advocacy groups, but they're, you know, they're just like the doctor organizations. They're all balkanized. We need one entity to stand strong. And, and I, I hope we'll get there. Well, that's a good point, right? It should be made up of physicians and patients. Yes. Actually, it yes. really shouldn't be, they shouldn't be separate. No, no. I think, you know, started with the physicians because, you know, there's just a million of them that uh, we can identify and get them together as many as possible. Then you start adding on. Are there patients. really a million physicians in the yeah. United States? Yeah. You know, the fact checking of the New Yorker is amazing when they, I, I've never experienced that before, but they tracked down everything and they got to the, the numbers that I never could get to. So not all of them are practicing. There's about 900, almost 900,000 are actually practicing in some respect, but wow. there are a million docs in this country. Have you done the math about how many doctors we would need under this new regime of empathic, intelligent, artificial 
this yeah. symbiotic relationship. In other words, because because there's a bunch of moving pieces, right? It's radiologists still exist, but now they're there to talk more with patients and interpret the diagnosis as opposed to make the diagnosis, right? And you're still going to need the internist, but now they have more time with the patient and they don't have to worry about the diagnosis as much as they have to worry about the treatment. Directionally, Eric, do we need the same number of physicians? Are we going to need more physicians? Or are we going to need less physicians in 30 years on a per uh, yeah, patient yeah. basis? You know, when I did the UK review, we got into that. And we had economists and all sorts of brilliant people modeling on that. And I think what we'll see is even though everything now would suggest we need a lot more doctors because of the aging population and all the comorbidities and the complexity. I mean, if you just look at, like, for example, how do you care for a patient with cancer today? It's gotten very complex. So you would project we're going to need, you know, a steep growth curve. But what we're going to see, I think, is a big blunting of that because we are going to be the machine story is not just about doctors relying more on machines getting support. It's also about consumers, patients. And so when you get the outsourcing and the offloading, you start to see a pretty big, and then when you get rid of the hospital story and just have surveillance centers, remote monitoring, you start to see a very less need for expansion. So I don't see what we're going to, you know, be a, a decline, mm -hmm. but just a difference in the curves as they go forward over the next few decades. And there will also be this, I don't know, for lack of a better word, kind of a growing pain as people transition. I mean, most of the radiologists I know today, you know, for example, have very technical backgrounds. I mean, any of the MRI folks I know, you, they usually have a great background in physics and things like that. So all of a sudden there's going to be a different selection criteria. For example, you may want to choose radiology independent of how technical your background is in physics or mathematics. Right. And so it's like, it takes a generation to make these switches. Do you see any other types of changes in how people will select into different specialties? Well, that's hard to know. I think we have theorized, Sarab Ja and I from Penn Radiology, that there might be a new specialty that would just be radiology and pathology combined, at least the, the pathologists who work with slides, because wow. it, they're, it's just very basically. similar interaction with the computer. And they're often very much, as you know, integrated. So that might be a whole new specialty over time. But, you know, overall... One thing we don't want to forget here is that the empowerment of patients to do doctorless diagnoses of most common conditions, whether that's an ear infection of a child or a urinary tract infection, a skin rash or skin lesion, and on and on, the routine things are not going to have doctor in the loop. Only if you know a treatment is needed, perhaps. And that's only in the U.S., not in a lot of other countries. So that is going to change also specialties because today you look at pediatrics, you know, it's a wonderful specialty, but a lot of that could be decompressed if you give parents more autonomy for their kids. So we're going to see lots of changes based on the, on the patient side or the parent side of things, which I think has not been adequately appreciated. If you could conduct any experiment and there were no limits on the resources you had, so you could... And it could be a, an experiment within the, the real recesses of basic science. It could be a real translational experiment that takes something to the, from the cutting edge of the bench to the bedside, or it could be the largest clinical trial ever done to test a question that vexes you without any new introduction of a new technology, but just simply asking a question like the Vioxx one, for example. You know, those, those, take as much time as you want, but I'd love to know what would be a dream experiment for you if this is the one shot on goal where you've got billions of dollars and no holds barred? Yeah, no, I, it's easy, actually. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah, for me. I mean, I'm, I, it's a dream. You know, I wrote about this with Kai-Fu Lee and uh, Nature Biotech last month, and it was called It Takes a Planet. And basically it would be to, the experiment would be to develop a planetary digital infrastructure with all the data of each individual and continually being assessed and assimilated a process inputs. Federated AI, so the data never leaves the country, whether it's China or the U.S. or wherever. So you, there's not a privacy security. But the point being is when a new person comes in and we want to prevent a condition or better treat it, and we have billions of other people to draw from, 
and we have these digital twins, if you will. Because today we learn from clinical trials, and it's really farcical in many respects because those clinical trials are contrived, and the benefit is three per hundred or something like that. What about the other people? Well, not only that, it's often three per hundred because of the heterogeneity of the population. Exactly. It it might be 30 per hundred if you knew who to apply it to. Yeah, so so my experiment would be just for that, you have pinpoint precision because I know Peter's twins, all of them around the world. And how, what treatment they got and what outcomes they got yeah. and what, how I could prevent their issue that they otherwise had. And so it would be to develop the ultimate learning health system. And the twin you're defining is obviously not just genetic, but it's every everything. layer, every layer. So it's my gut twin, my epigenetic twin, or my approximate genetic twin, my phenotype twin, my metabolic twin. Right. And that's, I think, where we can go in the future. And it it involves many different types of AI. And I think we'll get there someday. And it's an experiment. Is that that a 50 year? I mean, what realistically Uh, is? I think it could be done in 20 if we we really were going after it because it's doable. You know, the question is- That strikes me as bigger than any one country though, right? No, no, but if 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 you get the US and China to start it because of the diverse population and the largeness, the US being third in population in the world. And you get that going, and then the rest of them join on. You know, you pretty quickly you will have twins. Do you have a sense of how much that could cost per person? It just depends on the layers of data and the analytics. I mean, it's not going to be trivial, but less than you would think. This is mostly, you know, in silico work. It's not, you know, I mean, it's, it's happening what's, anyway. What's, what's, this, what's, this data all sits in places that's all fragmented. What, what's the what's a price of a full exome sequence today? In, b- both, a, f- a full genome sequence today. So not a 23 in me, but where they're doing the full sequence. Yeah, well, exome 400, a full genome 8, 900. So, you know, they're, so they're sub they, a thousand. They're, they're going to keep coming down. And at scale, perhaps, you know, that's going to happen even faster. But you start having all these things done at scale. And, you know, right now we, we don't have enough the reason why a genome isn't valuable is because we don't have a billion people with a sequence and a, and a phenotype. Once we start to get into those big numbers, then we start do you, to do you decode believe, so, so, do you, so you don't think it's that the genome is not deterministic enough? You think it's too small an N so far? That's is a, a bigger big, problem? big part of it, yes. I mean, a genome will never be fully deterministic. I mean, that's not possible. Probabilistic, yes. But it, the probabilistic side of it is hampered because of inadequate numbers. Yeah, because I got to tell you, right now, I find every time my patient sends me their genome, I just roll my eyes and say, like... No, there's a limited amount of value. Yeah, well, you know what I usually say to them? I say, look, anything in here that matters, we already know. You know, if you're a 40-year-old, and, and unless you were adopted, you know, sometimes you, you figure out, you know, this person has Lynch syndrome or something that yeah, you but, had to know. So there are some numbers on that. If you look at the Danville, Pennsylvania, Geisinger Health System, where they've done over 100,000 people. They have exomes, not full genomes, but the coding yep. elements. And they have 5% that they find something quite important, so-called pathogenic. So like Lynch syndrome or BRCA or yeah, yeah. sudden death uh, arrhythmia. Which again, my point is, if you're doing your job as a doctor, you you should have figured that out in the family history and gone looking for it, but not with... I mean, in other words, in other words, you should have gone to the genome to be confirming what you suspected, hopefully. Yeah, but, you know, a lot of that's missed. Like BRCA is a perfect example. You know, what about BRCA men carriers? Yeah, yeah. You know, you just don't know. But and you're so, taking a good family history, don't you? I mean, it, it, I guess it depends on how much the patients know about their family, too, but... Yeah. But you're right. No, those are those are those are good examples. But when I look at the like, how many times do I look at Prometheus and it spits out, oh, you're at a higher risk for atherosclerosis and a higher risk for diabetes, and I'm like, this is such nonsense, right? Like, if you actually understand how to evaluate lipids and you're wearing a CGM, you certainly don't need this thing to tell somebody. No, uh, Prometheus. I mean, I think there's gross deficiencies of outputs because, again, going back to, we don't have one central do you know repository what the of data. Is? Oh, Online gosh. Is? How small is it? In terms of how many millions of people have had sequence, mm-hmm. it's small still. You know, it's in the 10 to, well, it's in the less than 10 million for sure of whole whole genome sequence. And then, um, of course, how many do we have accurate phenotyping on? Because the, if, the, if the phenotype is not that accurate, well, then it dilutes the quality of what you're trying to do, right? That's essential because what phenotype we have is fixed. 
at the moment the genome was assessed. That's exactly. We right. don't That's know. A great Their point. phenotypes change. So all the studies that so we have. So this has to be living, breathing, and longitudinal. Exactly. And that's why I'm trying to see our way through, like, you know, the, the all of us study of the million people that we're onto right now is the beginning of something like that, where all the layers of data for long-term follow-up, it's still tiny, 100,000. I mean, a million people is tiny, but it's a start. But if we could get the leading countries in the world to get behind this, you know, this is something that should uh, override concerns about competition in countries. This is about, you know, for mankind, humankind, then we might be able to really develop something that would promote health of all human beings. That would be far reaching. And you know what? I actually think this is going to happen someday. I know it sounds far-fetched. I know you think, looking at me like I'm a little cuckoo. No, but- I mean, I, look, I, you, a lot of things seem far-fetched in the moment. I think it's, truthfully, I think it's technologically more capable. It's more possible to me technologically than it is politically. Okay, well, because that's good I, to hear. I because, like that. Because I don't... I like that. I think the biggest challenge, I'm, I'm doing the back of the envelope math, just, I think it's a couple trillion dollars to Could do be. this in the United States alone. Might be, and I don't know. Depends on how, how long, I mean, this is over forever. It, you know, exactly. Like, yeah, Which yeah. means it's a moonshot and I don't feel like our political environment is capable well, of hey, moonshots. We're anymore. just trying to live day to day here now. Yeah. So, so long gone are those days when you could make a bold we're going to spend the equivalent of a couple trillion dollars over 20 years long after I'm gone, meaning me, meaning the politician who's going to be the, the, the torchbearer of this to make this a reality. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a jaded, skeptical guy when it comes to our well, political it's, it's system. Actually, but. It's actually healthy to be that looking at it that way. And also, I want to also frame it, Peter, as it is an experiment because you still have to, once you develop it at some scale, you still have to prove that it's helping people. Right. So you'll need to use a biased and an unbiased subset of these. Yeah. So, you know, it's theory, it's intriguing, it's doable, and it's going to get progressively better, you know, what we can put in as input, but it's still a question mark. Will it improve? I just think that our complete reliance on clinical trials is misled. I completely agree. I think the heterogeneity problem and the exposure, the time of the, the time under the curve, the exposure problem make clinical trials very difficult to extrapolate from. I, I mean, here's one of my favorite pet peeve examples is people are so quick to dismiss Zetia as a useful drug. But in reality, it's never once, to my knowledge, been targeted towards patients that are hyperabsorbers of sterols. Right. And yet, you know, so, so Zetia gets sort of diluted in clinical trials because you're giving it to patients that have normal and abnormal absorption of sterols. And so... On balance, it doesn't look like a very interesting drug. It seems to work okay with a statin. But I'm convinced there are patients out there taking statins who should be taking Zetia because if you, you can phenotype this. Sure. You can really see people who don't make that much cholesterol, but they absorb it like crazy. It's but, amazing. But, but that who's going to do that clinical right. trial, right? No one's going to do that clinical trial. The lack of interest of the people that manufacture the drug because of dilution of the, of the market. I mean, it's really unfortunate, but you're, you're absolutely right about that. Well, Eric, this has been this has been a really interesting discussion, and I'm glad. Uh, it's crazy that it took a decade for us to. I mean, I, I'm amazed you n- knew my name. I'm flattered, but I, I've certainly known about you for from the day I got to San Diego, and I'm just glad it, the, the podcast and your book really became a good excuse to sit down. So thank you, um, thank you for your work, most importantly, but also thank you for making the time today. I know you've talked about this a lot. And I'm sure you didn't necessarily feel like talking about the book Oh, and some of these stories over and over again, but I, I know that people listening to this are going to appreciate it. Well, thanks, Peter. I, I t- we talked about things I, I actually haven't really gotten into in the past, but I also you know, really enjoyed great intellectual thinking with you. It's fun. And I hope we'll have a chance to get together a lot more in the years ahead. Oh, we certainly will. We're, we're almost neighbors, so <laughs> it has to happen. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of The Drive. If you're interested in diving deeper into any topics we discuss, we've created a membership program that allows us to bring you more in-depth, exclusive content without relying on paid ads. It's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Now, to that end, membership benefits include a bunch of things. One, totally kick-ass comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, thing we discuss on each episode. The word on the street is nobody's show notes rival these. Monthly AMA episodes or Ask Me Anything episodes, hearing these episodes completely. 
access to our private podcast feed that allows you to hear everything without having to listen to spiels like this. The Qualies, which are a super short podcast, typically less than five minutes, that we release every Tuesday through Friday, highlighting the best questions, topics, and tactics discussed on previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and necessarily listen to everyone. Steep discounts on products that I believe in, but for which I'm not getting paid to endorse and a whole bunch of other benefits that we continue to trickle in as time goes on. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all with the ID peteratiamd. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you listen on. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. Mm-hmm.